Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Linda Massey, and we're going to start in about two minutes. I'm just we're just welcoming uh, people in from the waiting room. So I'll come back on in uh, two minutes and we'll get going. If you haven't had a chance to uh, complete the pre-survey um, from the waiting room or from last night, there's also a link in the chat box. Uh, it only take you about three minutes and we really appreciate it if you did that before we started. Thanks a lot. Back in about a minute and a half. Welcome everyone to the Human Trafficking Awareness Webinar um, offered by OPC uh, this afternoon. And I'm very pleased to be hosting today and our main presenter is Laura Somerville. So I'm Linda Massey and I'm the Associate Director of Principal Association Projects. And that's the kind of the department at OPC that works with the Ministry of Education projects and also the federal, the Government of Canada projects um, like this one. Um, and uh, we're very happy to have our project lead, uh, Laura Somerville, who, um, along with her, the other project leaders, one for CPCO and one for ADFO, the French principles, um, lead kind of lead the project and have developed the resources that you're going to see later on in, in this webinar. And we're supported well, today yeah. by. Oops, someone has their audio on. And we're supported today by um, Brad Harris um, from OPC. So we appreciate his help in terms of all the technical uh, support for us. Now, I'd like just to do um, a brief land acknowledgement. And perhaps in your own mind, you can be thinking of where you are located and what would be the appropriate land acknowledgement for where you are. We acknowledge this land on which our work and the work of our partners takes place. It is the traditional land of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishabe. We are thankful to live and work here and share in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And in the, the same frame of mind as, as sharing friendship and respect, uh, this project, the Human Trafficking Awareness Project, is a collaborative project. And we are the three principal associations. So this is the OPC webinar and uh, Catholic principals. Um, they've had their webinar, they're having their webinars today as well. And Leadership en Action is the ADFO workshop that'll be held next week. So all of principal associations have collaborated to develop this webinar in the appropriate languages, of course. And the lead and the, uh, the chair of the project is the Victim Services Toronto. So they're the ones who hold this uh, project in terms of the contract with the federal government, because unlike most of our uh, government funded projects, this one is funded by the Government of Canada. And as you can see, the Women and Gender Equity Canada funded this. And we're coming to the end of this three-year project, actually. Uh, March is our last, last month. And this is our last activity with principals and vice principals. And the legacy of the pro project is going to be the wonderful resources that have been developed that Laura will be sharing with you today. In terms of the, the project description, in terms of our objectives and, and 
what we're delivering on behalf of WAGE itself, as promising prevention and response practices, as well as just the third one there, um, the resources for school leaders, that, that's our focus. Actual um, projects on human trafficking is across Canada. So each province has a project or two being funded around um, preventing and responding to human trafficking. So if we look at the last um, bullet there about evaluation and scalability of promising practices, after our work, after our, we've had focus groups, we now have this webinar with two surveys, a pre and a post survey, all of that will be put together um, to create and write kind of a model of one way that uh, we can help in terms of human trafficking with educators. So with, in our case, school leaders. So that's why this project is so important and why the survey that we started the webinar with is important and the one that will end the webinar with is very important. The J Research is the research uh, group that processes and, and writes about all of our feedback that we've been receiving. There's been a lot of feedback over the last two years. So we'll write up a lot um, afterwards. So your contribution to this, your recommendations to us are very valuable and your survey responses are anonymous and, and confidential. It's actually what you say, and the feedback that you get is what is important to us. Thank you. I'm turning it over to Laura. There you go, Laura. Hey, thank you, Linda. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We know you're you're super busy, and if you're in an elementary school, I really hope you didn't have to have an indoor lunch. It's raining down here on the waterfront in Toronto, and I, I feel for you. I was an elementary principal for many, many years, and I know when I see that rain, I think, oh, oh no. Anyway, um, we are going to uh, show you our resources, and it is important that um, that you understand why uh, we really want to roll this out to the field, because these resources have been created not only with a lot of input from a variety of, uh, of groups, but they've actually been written with you in mind. So they are principal, uh, vice principal resources written by principals and vice principals. So while I'm the lead for OPC and we have a lead for ADFO and, and CPCO, uh, we actually did have a lot of input from the field as well um, with as we were going along. And, you know, again, they're living documents. We, we're always open for suggestions and, and tweaking and all that kind of thing. Um, so if you don't mind, I did want to say hello on camera, but I am going to turn my camera off because I'm, I'm running Running, uh, running a variety of things here all at once. And the last thing I need to do is look at myself. Um, what I'd like to do is to actually show you not only these three resources, but we're actually going to go live into the OPC website so that you can see where they are housed. So if you'll just bear with me for a minute, uh, I'm just going to stop this share and then go into a share uh, of the website that is open up live. Ah, it worked. It's good. I always love it when it works. All right. Um, so if you go on the OPC website, uh, there's a wealth of information there. And what's interesting about this particular project is that we do not have this be behind the firewall uh, that's for our members only. We actually have this on the public facing side of the website because we do want everyone to have access to it because it's it's just good information. So while you see under my profile, you see my number and and my uh, my little dots there for my login, um, that's not necessary. It's just something that pops up online. So we're on the OPC website and because of the way our website is set up, there is a little bit of a scavenger hunt here. Uh, for you to find these resources, but once once you get working the website, you'll you'll see it's perfectly uh, easy to do. So we go into professional learning, and then we go down to ministry funded projects. Now, as Linda said, this particular project is uh, funded federally, uh, which is great. But we also have a companion project that's funded uh, through Ontario, and and I'll show you a little bit about that if we have time uh, near the end. So. We're on to professional learning, and then we're going to get down the side here to where it says human trafficking awareness prevent and prevention. And we click on that, and now this is our landing page, and this is where we'll spend the bulk of our of our next uh, 20 minutes. So the three resources are, are all here. 
Um, and I'd like to start with <clears throat> the question and answer resource because I think it's the one that um, we worked the longest on in terms of getting voices from the field. And we have a number of questions and answers here that have come from, uh, like we said, our, our focus groups, but we've also uh, had that input from our community partners. So whether it be law enforcement, and we do understand that not, not every uh, community is, is comfortable or has trust with law enforcement. In this case, I can't stress enough how much uh, Toronto Police Services, as well as the OPP, because we want to make sure that we're addressing everything provincially, um, how much value added they were to the work that we do. Because at some point, when human trafficking does occur, more often than not, law, law enforcement will be involved in uh, in in a number of ways um, that that we really do count on. So I'm going to uh, just take you through. This is this is meant to be back pocket information for you. And by that I mean. By no means are you going to really absorb a lot of, of the things that we're talking about today. It's just far too copious. But I know when I was sitting in the in the principal's chair, I wanted to know that something was out there because human trafficking might not have been foremost in my mind on any given day. But on that day that it does pop up, I know that there's somewhere I can go to get some good information. And that's really what our goal is today, is to just uh, give you an awareness of what's out there and uh, and and hopefully give you some ideas as to how you could use that. So as an example, with our uh, with our Q and A, I'll just show you how this works. They are accordion, so you just click on the on the question, and uh, we'll just talk about you know what's the definition of human trafficking. So we have a national definition because there is a national strategy to combat human trafficking, um, and the government of Ontario defines human trafficking as recruiting, transporting transferring, receiving, holding, concealing, harboring, or exercising control, direction, or influence over that person for the purpose of exploitation, generally for sexual exploitation or labor, um, forced labor. Now, that's a very um, uh, governmental explanation as to what this is. But we wanted to show you that because then we go to the provincial definitions. And in the province of Ontario in particular, we've actually... Um, been able to tease out what is human trafficking and then what is sex trafficking. For the purposes of our work, we've really been focusing more on um, uh, sex trafficking. However, there are elements of human trafficking that that can enter into our, our school system as well. So it is, uh, is it, like I say, it is more of an awareness. Um, something else I'd like to show you is, uh, here's a little question. How does human trafficking occur? And this is a, a continuum that we wanted to show you. And again, we've worked with law enforcement. So some of the language that, that you'll see in here uh, might not be sort of the traditional kinds of language that, that we maybe use in the school system, but this is the kind of language that's, that's being used in the field with all of our, uh, our uh, collaborative agencies. So often it starts out uh, through luring, and there's a, a definition of luring. Um, uh, and this is often referred to as love bombing, which which you can uh, look that up a little bit later, uh, and grooming. So luring and grooming are often where it begins and where it's seen in the school system. And uh, again, so much of this is also done uh, not only uh, face to face, but also you know, when, when kids are online with a variety of different platforms. But then it escalates and you can see as this continuum goes, there's luring, grooming, then there's isolation. Of once you have a, a sort of a kid in, in your grips, manipulation. So maybe during the course of this, you've had that, uh, that, that kid send pictures to you or whatever, and now you're threatening to send, to publish those if they don't send you more or do certain things for you. The exploitation is where things grow. And then the recruiting piece uh, is fascinating because what we did find um, through our work is that often uh, girls who have been recruited and have been in the, have been being trafficked for a long time. One of their ways out is to recruit other kids to come in. So uh, it can actually be, uh, you know, older girls recruiting younger girls. This is not to say that boys don't get uh, don't get recruited as well, but the vast majority of the human trafficking that that we are seeing um, is with girls. But we do have some case studies where uh, where we can, we'll show you in a little bit 
uh, where we do have boys involved too. So again, there's the, the continuum and the explanations. Then we have the, uh, the three elements of trafficking. So there's the act, the means, and the purpose. So the trafficker must, under the act, uh, commit one or more of the following acts. So recruit, transport, uh, transfer, harbor, you can read those, using one or more of the following means. So they're either violent or they're threatening violent, which is violence, which is often something that happens with our kids, uh, coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, and abuse of power. And then for the purpose, well, the purpose is for sexual exploitation, um, lab forced labor, slavery, servitude, organ removal. We haven't heard a lot about that, but, but obviously it's there for a reason. And uh, forced labor or services. So the recruiting tactics are also here. And this is where we get into a little bit of the love bombing types things, but potential traffickers uh, will find ways to, to um, be involved with their people, their uh, victims, if you will, by pretending to be potential love interests or friends or, or, or uh, sponsors of some kind. Um, you know, they're looking uh, for kids through newspaper ads or postings online or, or whatever. So again, you can see where there's a wealth of information here that is something for, again, keep in, in mind for a back pocket information. But when we look at these, uh, these pro uh, protocols, you can see where, you know, they can actually uh, influence us in the schools. Um, what I'd like to do is take a look at uh, another two other questions here mm -hmm. just quickly. Uh, who are the most vulnerable people that are being uh, trafficked? And you can see again, girls, Indigenous girls, youth between 12 and 17, uh, 13, 14 seems to be a prime age where, where kids find themselves in, in issues. Uh, LGBTQ, uh, homeless kids or runaways, new immigrants. And uh, this is something that's really uh, taken off in the last few years with the influx of new immigrants in into Canada. Um, you know, they, they are maybe a little more trusting sometimes than, than they should be. Uh, which is a sad state of affairs, isn't it? And then uh, children of migrant workers too, because there's always that threat of, of deportation or, or whatever. So fair bit of stuff there. Um, some of the warning signs of human trafficking. Here are some things that you might notice. And again, just some nuggets for you to consider if you're noticing a change in behaviors that, uh, that some of your students may have. Some language to, to consider. Um, keep in mind, we worked with uh, extensively with people from victim services. And in, in our case, we actually worked extensively with two uh, women who had been trafficked for many years. And a lot of the language and, and suggestions that they brought forward were really something uh, in terms of us sort of not even really thinking that 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 people function this way. So this is very much survivor informed, which is why some of the language may not be things that we're used to uh, traditionally talking about in in school systems. Not that we're afraid to talk about them, but it's it's just a little different lens here. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, Internet piece, general behaviors uh, that that are something to be concerned about. So, for example, um, somebody is providing too much information uh, too soon when you've just met them on the internet or they want to meet up really quickly or they uh, know a way that you can earn some quick money. So there's all kinds of, of things to, to think about there. Now, uh, again, all of these questions are valid, but if we take the, um, the ideas here of the warning signs of human trafficking, what we did was we actually took the, the, the headlines, if you will, there and turned it into an infographic. This is a one pager. So this is the second document that we're showing you today. And it's a human trafficking awareness infographic. And this is something uh, that could have a variety of uses, um, whether you choose to you know, just have it posted in the school, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to use that um, with students, older students to help stimulate, get as a conversation starter. Uh, to use with school councils or or individuals or parents, individual parents that have been involved or want to know more. Uh, this is something you, you're welcome to put on your websites if you're so inclined. But uh, what what do we know about human trafficking? This is that that the thing that is really interesting. 13 years of age seems to be the average age where re where recruitment starts. 92% um, of the victims knew their traffickers before they actually got involved in in human trafficking. Um, there were uh, a number of um, 
victims who were who were trafficked and then you know recruited other other kids to be trafficked. So it's just good general information for you. Uh, again, some of the warning signs, these are just a few of, as I said, the, the headlines, if you will, uh, that we took out of the previous uh, Q&A document, but things you might notice, more absences in schools, grades dropping, change in attire, a withdrawal from friends, language that you might be aware of. So maybe the, the sexual vocabulary has grown. Um, there's talk about quotas or paying my bill, uh, which is a, a sort of lingo for trafficking. Um, and there's inconsistencies in stories, like where, why did you leave at lunch? Where did you go? What is happening? Uh, and then general general behaviors to take note of. So, so the love bombing, somebody who is quite vulnerable uh, can end up, uh, you know, really falling prey to someone who's giving them a tremendous amount of attention and gifts and, and you know, wants to protect them and take care of them and, and isolate them. So general behaviors, um, keeping chats a secret, you know, that's a, that's a tricky one. That's a fine balance. Uh, exchanging of uh, nude photos. And this is the one that I think is, is the most heartbreaking because, uh, you know, somebody very trustingly sends an intimate image to someone who they think is their intimate partner. And then the next thing, you know, that then becomes um, what they're threatened with, that this will be published or sent to their parents or, or, or whatever. So, the other piece on this uh, document that's interesting is we do have a number of links uh, for a variety of different places, the Human Trafficking Info Hub uh, and Indigenous Trafficking. You can see all those types of things. And of course, uh, uh, hotlines. So this document is, is uh, the best way I would view it is as a conversation starter. So whether, again, whether it be with staff, with students, whether it's posted somewhere, it's just good to, to get this conversation, conversation started. So... Um, the next piece I'd like to go to, though, and uh, this this takes us a, a, a little bit of time. We want to honor your time today. Is we're going to look at general tips and and uh, some some case studies. So we uh, again working with our victims of human trafficking. Um, it's kind of interesting because they gave us a number of general tips, which are very much through their lens, through their their experience. Um, as we mentioned earlier. Um, they're inspired by them and uh, they've offered us th some practical advice uh, and it, it is through their perspective. These women are now working through social service agencies like victim services, but they brought uh, a trauma informed lens to the work that we have. So, you know, uh, at least there, there is um, some uh, positive elements coming out of their horrific experience in that they've been able to share things with us. Now, the reason I, I say this is when you first see, you know, the first nugget, remain non-judgmental. I, I, I know we would think, well, we're not judgmental, we're, we're principals and vice principals. But again, obviously, this is something that maybe they've experienced. So please uh, look at these through the lens and, and in, the, in the manner that they were, they were meant to be. Uh, but choose your words and actions carefully. Just be sensitive. It's important um, for those who are disclosing information that their experience and personal information that they divulge is valid and taken very seriously, which I, I think we would all do. Um, what was interesting is when we got down into more trauma-informed type things where it says, <clears throat> meet the individual physical needs of students. Uh, often these kids who are being trafficked are... Uh, are are being influenced in other ways. And um, they they don't really have, they might have food insecurity, they might have uh, housing insecurity. Uh, these kinds of kids, if they come forward to you, they are often going to need things, fundamental things like snacks and beverages and warm clothing and a, a nice blanket. And, you know, they've just really, really been through a traumatic experience. So uh, some suggestions from our survivors. Um, they uh, suggest that we create a, a safe space for these students to be in and, and talk at their own pace. Uh, they're terrified of consequences, whether it be uh, everything from, I don't want my parents to find out to I'm so embarrassed to I'm afraid my family will get deported if anything comes out over this. So um, there's some, there's some pretty, pretty heavy duty things here. And, and I very much appreciate these uh, suggestions from our survivors. Um, before we jump into the case studies, we, I just want to tell you a little bit about how they can be used. Um, we have uh, seven case studies that represent, you know, a, a variety of thought-provoking suggestions and a variety of ages and and uh, stages in, in a child's life. Um, we're thinking that you can use them for staff or for parents or age-appropriate students. Uh, each case study provides an opportunity to customize 
um, so that you can honor your, your current situation and student voice or lived experiences um, or diversity or anti-racist or anti-oppression kinds of practices that, that, that might apply here. Um, they're very, very flexible, uh, but they're, again, uh, get that conversation started. And um, they, we hope that they will meet the needs of, of some of the things that, that you're experiencing in school. So let's jump into, I'll show you the case study. So what we have is we've tried to, to come up with sort of a primary junior is, is a tricky one, but we do have a, a Claudia who is age eight in grade three, there's her pronouns, but then we have Whitney who's 16 in grade 11, Min who is 18 in grade 12, Emily, who is 14, Cameron, who's 18 in grade 11, Malachi, who is 17 in grade 12, and Taylor, who is 17 in grade 12. Now, through all of the experiences that you've had, you know that these ages matter um, under the, uh, under the uh, eyes of the law. But keep in mind, um, none of these kids are at an age of consent. So uh, while, while people can be in the sex trades, adults can choose to be in the sex trade. They can't, nobody can choose to be trafficked. And when we're looking at these age groups, none of these kids can give consent. So um, let's just jump into one of these case studies just quickly so I can I can show you how they're put together. So we'll start with Claudia and I'm just going to hit the high points here. I, I wouldn't dare um, read this to you out loud, but uh, Claudia is from Serpent River and her family uh, has a strong First Nations connection. Uh, Claudia has had some significant developmental channel uh, challenges and is on an IEP. And the teachers say that she's very shy, but she has a very advanced vocabulary around sex sexuality and immature themes. Uh, Claudia's mom is known to be in the sex trade, uh, but uh, she is actually being trafficked. And I, I, I don't think people are understanding the nuance there. So if you were to picture the characters, there's a, a, a biological father who's not in the picture, but a stepdad who is. And stepdad picks Claudia up two days a week and the teachers are noticing on those two days, Claudia is a different kid. She's she's her anxiety levels through the roof. Um, she obviously doesn't like spending time with this man who has had his own convictions in the past for a variety of things. So there's just a number of nuances within this case study that just the spidey sense goes up right away. So the staff is right to approach the principal with concerns about Claudia, uh, suspicions about the stepfather, suspicions about the mother being trafficked versus voluntarily in the sex trade, and also suspicions about what's happening to Claudia on those two days. Uh, so for example, are images being taken of her and, and sent out in the dark web? There's a variety of, of, of things and questions that are, uh, are here. Now, on page two of all of these, what we've done is we've put together, this is sort of a little cheat sheet for you. Um, what are the immediate concerns? What will be the long-term concerns? What will be your role as a school administrator? Uh, is there a place for future staff development uh, as we're looking at these case studies as you sort of get a, a feel for, for what your parents might, or sorry, what your, um, for what your uh, staff might know or not know or whatever. And then we've, we've offered an opportunity to sort of challenge our biases. So what would it look like after you've gone through this case study? Uh, you, you sort of ask the question, okay, what, what was your picture of the stepdad? What's your picture of Claudia's mother? And then what would it look like if Claudia was a boy or two-spirited? What would it look like if Claudia's stepfather was black or uh, non-Indigenous? What would it look like if Claudia lived in a downtown metro, uh, large metropolitan city? You, I'm sure, could come up with a number of different what-ifs. So this is where we like these case studies in that they're, they're there's twists and turns and, and they're copious, but there's also room to make them more your own. So I'll come out of Claudia here for a second. And the next one I wanna show you, and this is the last one I'll show you, is Cameron. And Cameron, um, is, this is a grade 12, a grade 11 student. He's 18 years old. He is on an IEP because he has a general uh, anxiety disorder, depression, but he's uh, also on the uh, spectrum, uh, autism spectrum but he's very, very talented musically. So Cameron has a fans only account where he's uploading uh, a number of self-created videos and cover versions of, of music and original music that he's written. And he starts telling people that he has been approached by someone who wants to be his producer. 
And the music teacher overhears a bunch of uh, Cameron's friends saying, boy, Cam must have really won the lottery to be able to purchase all this high tech equipment. And then another kid says, yeah, his new producer got them for him free. I just wonder what free means. And there's this whole innuendo as to who this producer is. Um, so the music teacher then uh, uh, takes this forward to, to the office. <clears throat> Something else that's interesting is Cameron is living in a group home. Uh, he's not living with his, his parents, but his parents are in the picture a little bit. But um, there, you know, there's a number of different concerns here. So if we go to page two, um, this one is absolutely fascinating because uh, what are your immediate concerns? What are your long-term concerns? What is your role as an administrator? Future staff development, you see the pattern there. But then you ask yourself, is there a duty to report anything at this point? And if so, to whom? Because is it possible that there actually is a music producer, a real producer who's actually trying to help Cameron? Or is there something more nefarious going on? Does Cameron's IEP uh, play a factor into any of this? And is Cameron actually being exploited? And those are, are really interesting questions to ask yourself. And then how that unfolds and who you bring into this or who you talk to is 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 very much uh, you know based on not only your experience and your situation, but what your board protocols are as well. And then what would it look like? Again, let's challenge our biases. What would it look like if he was 16? Because as we know, it's 16 versus 18. They're, 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 they're two different air, uh, classifications in the eyes of the law. What would it look like if a classmate had introduced Cameron to the music producer? As we said before, maybe the classmate is a, is a recruiter for someone, or maybe the classmate knows a music producer. Um, what would it look like if Cameron's parents came to you with these concerns and wanted some help, even though they don't live together, they're worried about this too. And what would it look like if Cameron lived at home? So as you can see, there's been a tremendous amount of thought put into these. Um, and uh, it would it would be, uh, might be worth your while to take a look at them sometime just to see if, if there's any nuances in there. Keep in mind, although they look like for the vast majority of them are secondary, uh, the secondary kids often have younger siblings at home. In one scenario, uh, somebody's asking for uh, intimate pictures, and then they threaten to publish those pictures if the um, victim doesn't start sending pictures of her younger nine-year-old sister. So it gets it gets it's really muddy, difficult stuff. But there's all kinds of ways in which uh, which some of these uh, these case studies can go. So with that. Um, I just want to show you a couple more things since we're in the website, if you don't mind, because uh, we, we've, we've got a little bit of time here. A companion project to our human trafficking awareness uh, project is something called the Healthy Relationships in a Digital World. This is a provincial project. Human trafficking is a federal project, but it's the same writing team. So what I want to show you here is a number of resources that uh, the same team has put together, and again with... Uh, not only coterminous with the three associations, but also with a number of our uh, partners uh, in, in uh, social services in the field, including law enforcement and victim services. And victim services is just such an invaluable partner in, in all of this. Um, but we have a number of resources that are available, uh, restorative uh, practice type things, uh, our HR placemat tool, PowerPoint. Some of you may have been on some of those presentations. I'll just quickly show you uh, as a reminder, what our placemat tool looks like. So this is sort of one-stop shopping. So on this side of the placemat tool, we talk about uh, prevention. So how do we how do we proactively plan for issues that are going to happen? And well, we're trying to navigate cyber violence and cyber bullying because, as you know, that's often where the human trafficking begins. So this is the prevention piece. Um, you know, some some general guidelines and questions, uh, planning for students, staff, and parents you know, resources that you may need, uh, just some some interesting information to, again, uh, get that ball rolling. But what I'd like to show you here is the proactive side, or sorry, the reactive side. So now something has happened in your school. And uh, what are the, the general questions? What's happening? How immediate is it? Who's in danger? What should be done right away? And then responses. What's your immediate response, short-term and long-term? But if you look in the middle here, we have a number of definitions that we have worked out extensively 
uh, with our community partners. And there's human trafficking partway down here. There's luring, sextortion, sexting, all those types of things. So this is a, a document where, as, as I think you can see, it's very much a companion document to trafficking. The other piece that's really interesting and why it's important that, that you understand this information is for you is it's also been vetted through our legal services and protective services uh, at our associations. So if you look over here where we talk about best practices, um, a lot of the best practices uh, are actually uh, things that we have put together to help protect our members. So to make sure that they don't end up going down some road that maybe they shouldn't have. And uh, we have recommendations for them, but we also have things we recommend that you don't do. So for example, search devices and, and get a screenshot of these images and things like that, um, because that, that gets really convoluted too. So I just want you to be aware that there is there is the two projects, but they do work hand in glove um, in terms of the, the types of things that, that they offer. And the last thing I'm going to show you before I totally come out of the website, and this is a little commercial, is uh, we are having um, this incredible symposium coming up on uh, May the 14th. <clears throat> and I'm sure uh, if you, if you uh, read the things that uh, Susie sends out on Wednesdays in terms of what's happening, and it's also on our X account and, and uh, a variety of things. But what's interesting about this symposium, and it is, it is a healthy relationships and a digital world symposium, but there's very much the human trafficking element that we will be exploring in there. So we have a number of keynote presentations and uh, not only is it going to be uh, law enforcement, uh, but it's also going to be one of our OPP presenters is going to uh, speak extensively on uh, AI, artificial intelligence and how that's impacting uh, the, the world of cyberbullying, cyber violence and human trafficking. Um, we'll have a number of, uh, we'll have a wonderful presentation from victim services, and then we'll dive into some case studies. There's a panel discussion, table discussion, and lots of practical resources, as well as an online follow-up. So something for you to consider. I know not everyone's got their calendar open to May yet, but uh, the registration is open, and uh, you're certainly welcome to, uh, to see about that. It, it'll be at the Delta Hotel face-to-face. Uh, down uh, at the airport uh, in Mississauga. So hopefully we can we can see some of you there. So I'm going to uh, come out of this right now and I'll go back into our slides. Just bear with me for a second, please. And um, there we are. Okay. And uh, so just as a as a little recap, we looked at the um, the Q and A. We looked at the one pager, which I think uh, is, a, is a wonderful conversation starter for a variety of different places. And uh, we did look at uh, the fact that we that we have some case studies. So um, another piece I wanna show you that's also on our website is, uh, as I said, Victim Services has been an invaluable contributor to this work and a uh, very much partner. And uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't know a lot about Victim Services uh, when I was in the schools. But uh, what we do have is a chart for all of our boards uh, right across Ontario and uh, where your victim services agencies would be. This is just a screenshot. So, uh, but as you can see, for example, in Algoma, they do have an Algoma victim services. There's our phone number, the websites, all those types of things. This is a living document. So we do update it as often as we can, but I'm sure you could find your board in there and then what, what victim services you can access. Um, they can do a variety of things. Uh, if you're if you're actually in the, the, the throes of a situation, victim services, can, can very much be there to, to support victims, just as the name implies. But also um, a number of the victim services agencies have presentations that can they can come out and actually do some work in the schools and, and, and talk to uh, students about a variety of different things. So just, uh, just a, a little something for you to keep in mind. Um, so with that, uh, I am, I'm finished my portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Linda. We would very much welcome your, your questions, your comments, your first impressions, uh, the chat box is open to you and, and we'd really appreciate that. But um, you know, we, we, are, uh, we are here to, uh, to answer it, any questions or, or you can just put your hand up and, and come right on and if you have a comment, so. Thank you very much, Laura. See, I really like Tiptoe Through the Tulips and this is a uh, Tiptoe Through the Tulips of Human Trafficking Resources. So thank you for highlighting those and, and leaving them for future uh, exploration 
by our participants uh, today. Um, as Laura said, if, if anybody wants to raise their hand, come on or make comments in the chat box, we're happy for that to happen. And while you're thinking about doing that, let's move on to the next uh, slide there as we wrap up today. Your voice matters uh, very much to us, as I was saying earlier, um, that um, Leger Research, uh, Leger Research is the one group that collects our survey data from the, these webinars. We had one in the morning and one this afternoon. And your feedback's so valuable. Some of it's, you know, it's a very quick demographics, click on things. And there's also the opportunity to give some written uh, feedback in, in short answers. And it is so very valuable um, to us. So um, Brad's gonna put the link in the chat box for the post survey. Also, after the webinar is over, he'll send you an email if that's going to be easier um, for you to take a bit of time to do. And probably tomorrow, um, we'll send out uh, an email with the post survey in it. And because your responses, your recommendations to us are going to help shape um, the report Leger will uh, write, it is all the data is confidential and, and anonymous. Um, it's going to really be valuable um, when this is shared with our fund um, wage a uh, woman and gender equity <laughs> women and gender equity equity left my mind for a minute um, and so that's why uh, we we really uh, would deeply appreciate you um, responding to the survey um, and in terms of our uh, getting in touch with Laura and me, very easy to do. There's my email and uh, Laura's email. And we're always happy to answer questions, give you clarification, even accept you volunteering in this air area as having a lot of um, some good experiences that you might want to share that might be helpful to other principals and vice principals. All of that is part of the collaboration uh, mode of thinking that we are always in. And thank you for your, your notes there in the chat box. I'm just having a, a look. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Hanny, for, for that. Very good. Okay, Tamara, that, those, that's really great. Uh, feedback um, to us as well in terms of something that goes um, deeper and has that purpose um, in mind for those who really want to do the, the dig deep into this. And um, all in all, um, okay. Um, I'm glad that uh, Janani, that you're going to dig into the healthy relationships resources as well, because uh, we've been creating them for quite a few years, and they are absolutely valuable and useful to you in terms of cyberbullying and cyber violence, which isn't getting better as an issue in our society, and in fact has, has deeper and nastier um, connotations as we get into AI. Laura, anything, last words that you would yes, like to as, say? As we said, everything's on the public-facing side of this website, so please, when you're going to your, uh, speaking to your colleagues or, or at your family schools meetings or anything, um, you know, just just pass this along because you know not everyone can can find the time during the day uh, to do this. So you know, it, it's there and it's it's part of uh, the the uh, perk, if you will, of of being a member of OPC or CPCO or ADFO. So please pass this on to your colleagues who you think might be interested. Thank you. It actually the the sessions recorded, so it <clears throat> will be posted once it's. Brad does his magic um, with the video at the recording, and it will be available for you to view again if you wanted to share it with a colleague. Um, probably, Brad, a couple of weeks. Is that how long it takes to get a recording posted on the, the website? Uh, a couple of weeks, a couple couple days, maybe a week. Oh, okay. Oh. That, that's good. Hi. All right, then. Thank you, everyone, and thank you in advance for your uh, for your feedback. Uh, we really appreciate it.